Hi everyone, uh, today what, what I want to do is go over the uh, our next lesson, which is chapter 9, lesson 2, which covers the early challenges of Washington's presidency. We have two essential questions that are listed here. You can see the first one is, what challenges on the frontier did the new government face? And the second one, why did Washington want to remain neutral in foreign conflict? And we'll go through that uh, very briefly here. Trouble in the new nation. You can see this quote by Washington says, The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is to have with them as little political connection as possible. It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the, of the foreign world. So, trouble in the new nation. Our nation is very young. Washington's getting a lot of pressure from other nations to get the United States involved in conflicts abroad. Uh, the French particularly are pushing... Uh, to get the United States involved. This was just after the French Revolution, and the the new French Republic, the first French Republic, are declaring war on most European nations. So they're trying to get the United States involved. Washington, however, wants to remain neutral, and he's also having to deal with some issues uh, between settlers and Native Americans in the West. And he particularly sends two individuals, Arthur St. Clair and Anthony Wayne, to deal with these problems. Uh, he's also having to deal with some issues here at home, and the first issue that he has to deal with, uh, as far as that goes, is the Whiskey Rebellion. And you're probably asking, oh my goodness, what is this? Well, um, whiskey is very popular, not just as a drink, but also as currency, as a medium of exchange. People used whiskey essentially as money. And Congress, they taxed the manufacture and sale of whiskey. This really angered some, some farmers in western Pennsylvania, and they responded uh, by burning buildings and attacking tax collectors. And the leaders of the government viewed this as a challenge. Washington, he steps up to the plate, uses his leadership skills, and he stops the rebellion. And we know, uh, we learned about Shays' Rebellion being an indicator of the weakness of the government under the Articles of Confederation. This is different. This shows the public that the government is strong enough and will use force, if necessary, to stop rebellions. Now, you can see here I used, uh, I used this piece of clip art. Uh, it's not a smiley face. It's not frowning. It is neutral. And I, I used that. Hopefully, that would stick in your mind as far as Washington's foreign policies. Like we talked about earlier, the French are trying to lure the United States into their war with Great Britain. Washington, he issues a formal proclamation of neutrality. So he's he has a formal document saying that the United States is neutral. Great Britain challenges this by capturing American ships. And this really puts some pressure on Washington to remain neutral. Now, as far as this proclamation of neutrality goes, most of his cabinet agrees. However, Thomas Jefferson, who uh, we'll find out later, uh, he and Alexander Hamilton have a bit of an issue politically. This was one of the, the first things that they disagreed on. Thomas Jefferson, who was Secretary of State at the time, believed that the United States shouldn't just give away this neutrality for free. They should essentially bid it out. Um, they should charge to remain neutral. Apparently, he believed that the United States was was so strong that um, the issue of their them being neutral, they could use that to their advantage. Alexander Hamilton disagreed, and he said, "No way. There's no way we're going to do that. That's our neutrality is non-negotiable." Uh, when we talk about Jay's Treaty, this has to do with our relationship with the British. Uh, Chief Justice John Jay was appointed to the Supreme Court by the President of the United States, George Washington. And he sent a Briton to solve the issue and to work things out with the British. Like I talked about, the, uh, the British and the French were involved in the French Revolutionary Wars. The result of this, this is that the British agree to leave. They agree to, to leave those uh, pre-revolutionary pre forts that they were still in in the Northwest Territory. So they finally leave. Uh, some Americans disagreed with this, and a lot of those Americans were supporters of Thomas Jefferson. They were afraid that the United States would have a closer relationship with Brit Great Britain, and this would kind of undercut the principles of democracy that they had worked so hard to, to obtain. They believed that this would lead 
uh, to the government being controlled by an aristocracy, wealthier citizens, instead of, you know, we the people. Uh, another treaty we're going to talk about here is Pinckney's Treaty, and this has to do with the Spanish. Uh, when, with the passing of Jay's Treaty, the, the Spanish were very worried that the United States and Great Britain, who were not necessarily enemies anymore, would work together against them. Uh, the Spanish are very powerful, and they control a lot of the area that we know of the United States today. Uh, it wasn't uh, the United States then, but... Um, uh, what we know of the United States today is a lot of it's controlled by the, by the Spanish at this time. Thomas Pinckney was sent to settle the issues. He's a diplomat. He's a statesman that Washington chose. The big thing that we get out of this as Americans, we have the right at this point to travel the Mississippi River, which is very beneficial as far as trade um, in New Orleans, which was um, a big center for trade um, at this time. So... That was the the big thing about Pinckney's Treaty. It also set up the boundaries for what would be considered Spanish territory and what would be under the control of the Americans. When we look at Washington's farewell address, he decides not to seek a third term here. This is the end of his his time as president. He wants to retire to Mount Vernon. We talked about how everything he does is setting a tradition for presidents that follow him. Uh, there was no rule that said that you know you had to only serve two terms but he's the one that starts the tradition of only of only doing two terms and you can look at these two quotes here in this in this farewell address he says that america should observe good faith and justice toward all nations and steer clear of permanent alliances in other words we should mind our own business we shouldn't make other countries upset we should do our own thing and stay out of other people's issues, other countries' conflicts. The biggest thing that Washington was concerned about, though, was stemming from problems in his own cabinet. Political parties are starting to emerge. Uh, we've got the Democratic Republicans on Thomas Jefferson's side and uh, the Federalists on the side of Alexander Hamilton. And we'll get into the differences between those two. We talked about Federalists before being those supporters of a strong central government. Uh, Jefferson's party of the Democratic Republicans would eventually become the modern-day Democratic Party. So, um, something that I thought was pretty interesting, and that's about all I have for you today. Thank you for your time. Uh, you can find uh, a download of this PowerPoint on the blog, as well as notes or an outline uh, to accompany it. Uh, please use this information uh, to prepare for upcoming assessments. Have a good night.